and Happy New Year to you all. Thank you. From my family to yours, I hope you've had a good Christmas, a good celebration, and are ready for this 2024 to begin. I'm, I'm Pastor David. I'm the campus pastor here, and it is my privilege, for real. Just like Stacy said that she enjoys her job, it's my privilege, for real, to share life with you all and to walk life with you together. And I'm so glad that she said she likes her job. We share an office. I mean, that was really, <laughs> that was a relief. I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> um, but for real, we love doing what we do um, because it is such a meld of work and life and following God together. And um, uh, New Year's Eve is such a good time for looking back and looking ahead, reflecting and then pondering as well. And so I picked this passage on purpose because I think it's a very good passage for looking back and for looking ahead. Um, in, in one sense, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it, as the Corinthian Christians face challenges or even face death, um, Paul implores them to look beyond their present sufferings, to look beyond what is seen and to look at what is unseen. Um, he lifts their eyes from a momentary kind of mentality so that they can see God and they can see eternity, they can see heaven. Um, it's been secured for them in Jesus. He, he wants them to lift their eyes from this to that, but he doesn't ignore this. Does that make sense? And so the reality that we are, are having both at the same time um, is something that he draws our attention to in this passage. And that's also personally part of why I selected this passage for us today because I've been pondering something um, deeply personal um, through the last couple months. Um, it speaks deeply to what my brother Rob is going through as he deals with a terminal illness. Um, this was a surprise to us um, in early November did not suspect that he had any illness of any sort, um, but he's not terribly old, and yet he has this, this diagnosis which is harsh and real. And um, I, I asked him more about this and what he's going through, um, and it reminded me of this passage, because this passage says it in a different way, but in, in his world, he is outwardly wasting away, yet inwardly being renewed day by day. His troubles don't always feel light and momentary, but they are achieving for him an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. <laughs> He's a longtime follower of Jesus. He loves God. And to watch him follow Jesus through what he's going through right now has been powerful. And I've asked him to give me a sense of what it's like to follow God in this because I have not walked in, in those shoes yet. And, and, and he said something that I've been pondering for weeks, and I wanted to share it with you guys because I feel like this is the life we're all living together. Let, let's ponder this a little. I said, what, what is this like for you, um, Rob, to be following God through this hard diagnosis and these harsh treatments that you have to go through? And he said, David, it's the, the wildest thing. <laughs> I feel like I have one foot here and one foot in glory. That took me aback in light of what I'm feeling for him. And I had to ponder it for a while, and I, I still kind of am. And so I hope that today doesn't feel just like a bunch of psychological musings, but actually feels like something practical for us, because um, I think it is. But what I've been pondering since then is like, oh, wait a minute, that's actually my reality too. <laughs> I just don't often think about it that way. Um, what he's facing, I'm not facing, so I don't often feel the urgency or the pressing in of that moment. Um, so when he said that, I, I pondered it more and realized that that's my reality. It's a, it's a common human experience to face the end of life. It's just that we don't ponder death in that way very often. The veil between here and heaven sometimes feel th feels thinner depending on our circumstances. So consider this for yourself for a second. How much do you and I talk about what is seen? You know, this passage talks about what is seen and what is unseen. It, we talk a lot about what is seen, you know. Um, a large part of my family's conversations, Amanda and I are talking about our schedule, like what's happening tomorrow? <laughs> and where are all the kids going? And what are we gonna handle today and tomorrow? And um, what is Joanna asking for now? <laughs> She's hilarious, guys. Um, but she currently has an ear infection and can only hear about every third word you say. And so you're speaking clearly to her and she says, you know, just keeps on going and just keeps ask, asking the same thing. And we're facing these momentary challenges, these, these things, these moments. And um, we are persevering through them and loving her. And my wife is such a good example of patience to her. <laughs> um, uh, and then if anybody wants a dog, like they can have mine, you know, like um, <laughs> there's, there's these momentary challenges, like, 
um, that just get, feel like they're kind of in the way of like bigger things, right? And yet when I think about what my brother's dealing with, it's like, okay, all of that stuff is just fine. <laughs> it's not a big deal, right? It lifts my eyes above them real fast. And then what lifts my eyes beyond that to God and eternity and um, his presence in our lives is like the next question. So maybe you resonate with like, okay, a lot of our talk, a lot of our togetherness and what we share together is about what is seen and right in front of us. We hit challenges though. We hit confusion along the way that sometimes drags us out of that as well. And we think about the really hard things that we're facing in life. We hit a crossroad of a decision and we're not sure which way to go. You know, we're not sure what to do. It feels confusing. As followers of Jesus, that often leads us to what? Seek his direction. Seek clarity from him. God, what would you have me do in this moment of, of lack of clarity or indecision? Um, we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, and we seek that. So I'm, I'm grateful that at least our thoughts get that far. But what I'm pondering beyond that is that we speak less of eternal life that starts now and lasts forever, about how heaven invades earth, about how God's kingdom comes and breaks in, and um, how much do we speak about that, which is a little less seen <laughs> and more about what is unseen. When I find God's direction through prayer and his word, I sometimes feel conflicted because my sinful nature wants to go my own way. Then I'm left at another crossroads. Do I speak actions of love through obedience to the Father or lean on my own understanding? Which am I gonna do? And there are times when that crossroad occurs as well. But the older I get and the more practice I have at following Jesus, um, I feel less and less in opposition to him, like I'm going a completely different direction, I now wonder more about this and see if this resonates with you um, as well, especially those who have been following Jesus a little bit longer. I wonder more now about how he makes the crooked paths more straight. <laughs> this work he does in my life to make it more obvious which direction to go and to follow him into it. The word says he's gonna do that, you know? And John the Baptist even said, you know, make the way, make the path straight. He came to, to make the path clear that Jesus the Savior was coming, that we might have this kind of life where we're not in opposition to God or fighting against him all the time, but we actually feel like he is our advocate, our friend, our Savior, and our Lord, and our Father, and all these titles we put on God and know him to be because he is this amazing trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So now I'm wondering more about how he brings my heart and my decisions in, into alignment with him. And I feel less in opposition with him, but now I have a new kind of gray problem <laughs> when I feel like the way is clear and I know, okay, God, I'm gonna follow you into this. Now my new gray problem is, is this my gut or is this God? <laughs> is this, a, I know I'm not opposing to him, but is it him or is it me? <laughs> and um, that's where I, I want us to lean into the presence of God a bit because this leads us to the daily practice of the presence of God. This is where we get deeper and follow Jesus into 2024. Some of you may have read the book by Brother Lawrence, um, Practicing the Presence of God. Um, there's uh, another book, my brother Rob, not Brother Lawrence, my brother Rob, um, has been reading The Practice of the Presence of Jesus by Joni Erickson Tata. This is a fairly new book that just came out, which is her reflections on the writings of Brother Lawrence on this very topic of how to lean into God's daily presence, that he recognizing that he is with us already. We don't have to wait until heaven. His presence is already here. And what a great Christmas gift that Rob gave to each of us, so many of us, that we could read together from this book as we are already drawn into what God is doing in this very moment in his life. We're already thinking that way, and yet he gave us a tool to do that. He's a good big brother. Rob, I love you if you're watching this. <laughs> Jenny, I love you too. His wife, his kids, I love you guys. And um, we're gonna walk through this together. But my brother's statement about having one foot in here and one foot in eternity um, is one that echoes across the verses that precede this chapter in 2 Corinthians. Listen to these verses. It says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be, be, may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Our lives are witnesses 
to God, to his creation, to his saving work. Later in verse 13, it says, Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. (laughs) Do you hear that promise? (laughs) Jesus has already risen from the dead. He has done that good work, and he is the foretaste of what is to come. And so our confidence that is spoken about later in this verse is in him and in that resurrection that we too will be raised and presented before God by Jesus, the advocate, who says, this one is mine. (laughs) This is ours. (laughs) We're his. And that confidence walks with us day by day. All of this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Now, Angie read the passage just earlier. Thank you, Angie. And it started with this verse in 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. And I think you just heard why. But let me say it again. Why? Because one, we know that the Father has saved us through Jesus. It's done. It's finished. And we can rest secure in that and we can live in that. We do not have to be on wavering ground. We do not have to walk around with extra burdens, although we do carry them at times of our sin and shame, but we can be freed from those things, and it is a great gift of God to live in that way versus another way. That is our great gift to share with other people, amen? Amen. (laughs) To let them know they can have that too, and they don't have to be stuck in this. And what a fun joy that is to share it with people. It's very satisfying to share it with people. It's joyful to do that. Number two, we know that even in in death, our lives testify to God. Think about some of the lost loved ones that we have in our lives whose lives still testify to God, that we still tell stories about, that we still thank God for. How their faith in God, their life, although imperfect, testified to God. And if we pass away, our lives will also testify to others. And that gives us not only confidence, but a sense of motivation for 2024. What a cool thing that how we live in 2024 will echo into other people's lives because God is so good to keep telling stories of his followers and of his redemption and his saving power. And then three, I think one thing we can ponder further is that God has not been secret about what matters most. When we examine the heart of God, we can start to see quickly what matters most to him and therefore what matters most in life to us. I'm not sure what you would put on that list. Maybe you got some notes that you're taking there. Maybe you would put some things down of what matters most to God and therefore what matters to me and therefore what matters for eternity, not just now, but for all time. I think we can look at God and we can see right off the bat that relationships and community matter to him deeply. (laughs) Uh, Take the Godhead three in one to start off with. We have relationship uh, within the Trinity itself, this loving, self-giving, sacrificing kind of communal relationship. And what he has done so good to make us strangers to one another at one point or another, family, right? I did not know any of you 10 years ago. (laughs) And yet we now share life together in ways that are profound and deep. And you welcome me into your lives to to oftentimes pinch myself and say, why do I get to do this, God? This is incredible that um, I get to know people in this way. And then you guys get to do that with each other and vice versa, right? Um, It's a beautiful gift. Um, I think another thing that God um, cares about deeply is wholeness. That we would be restored to him in relationship and that any brokenness in us and in the world would be restored as well. We could dig deeply into the word shalom and talk about that for a long time, but his ability to bring wholeness and peace to a broken world, to our own broken lives is really powerful. And so what he does to bring the kingdom on earth, even now, is really, I think, something he cares about deeply too. And that starts to frame our thoughts for, for, for what we care about, but it's really for God, his glory, and his kingdom at the end of the day. And you can see that in the life of Jesus. If you wanna see this spelled out more and see, okay, what does God care about? Well, what did Jesus do but gather a community unto himself of followers that he might invest in them deeply and help them see the kingdom for themselves and then go and share it with others? What did Jesus do on a regular basis but to go and spend time with the Father in prayer and relationship with him? Uh, What did he speak about the most commonly over and over and over again but God's kingdom and how it was now coming here on earth and he was bringing restoration and salvation? 
And as much as people didn't quite track with it in the moment and understand, even his disciples didn't gather all that he was trying to teach, it unfolded and it unfolded and it unfolded further again, even in the disciples' imperfect lives. And here we are all these years later following this same Jesus that they followed. We get to enjoy the relationship, that relationship with him for eternity. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, it says that we have been given the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. It's pretty incredible how um, the most basic things in life can be filled with meaning when God is present in them, when we recognize his presence, when God brings his kingdom into the present, when we live in step with the spirit. There is purpose and meaning all around us, but we don't often feel that way, right? We often feel like, oh, this is kind of a meaningless thing that I'm doing. But when we're doing it in the presence of God and for God and for his kingdom and for his glory, then things take on a different meaning, a different satisfaction, a different purpose. And so as you look at 2024, you might start to consider what are the things that I'm going to spend time on and invest in and what matters most to God. But you can also be thinking about how even the most mundane things are a matter and a part of the kingdom and part of practicing the presence of him with us. This is the foretaste of things to come and practicing Jesus and his presence now. So if I look back, I can look back on 2023, think back on a memory of 2023 real quick that you're grateful for. You know, the the joy of some of those moments. I don't know what's coming to mind, but I I think back to my mom's 70th birthday and that was really cool. You know, we got to be together as a family and celebrate her. I think about a great anniversary trip with my wife to Louisville and getting to have fun with her and enjoying that, being married for all these years and just being grateful for that and looking at our kids and being grateful for them look back on a, 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 a high school senior who's making college decisions. I think about a lot of things, you know, like important stuff going on. And yeah, there's been some, some, some hard stuff along the way, too. Um, I'm grateful for, for that. Um, remember this passage as we face 2024, because we could look forward to 2024. We could be really excited about a lot of things. Are there things you're excited about? Are you looking forward to some things? Yeah, that was, that was a great response. I should have set you up more. I should have given you more time to like ponder that for a minute. (laughs) But seriously, 2024 is gonna be full of 365 days. Amazing things can happen. What? 366. Oh, man. See, I'm glad I have you guys, so this is good. (laughs) This is the give and take of life together, all right? I... I ponder those moments a bit in this moment and wonder what life is gonna be like for us. There's gonna be some ups and downs. There's not gonna be all good and there's not gonna be all bad. There's not gonna be only crossroads, but there's gonna be a lot of this like in alignment with God of following him together. Because if we are practicing the presence of God, we are walking with him together and wondering and dreaming and seeking him together, which is a very rich, purposeful thing in and of itself that we might do that kind of life. Some people might look at 2024 and wonder if it's gonna be a complete mm, disaster. (laughs) There's things coming down the pike that we can anticipate that it could be a hard year. It could be a very challenging year, (laughs) right? My brother is facing a very challenging year ahead. But what about following God together even in that? Because this passage says, therefore we do not lose heart. Because our our heart and our hope are not in the momentary what is seen. Our hope is in something much bigger that God has lifted our eyes to in these passages and what he's doing in our lives. And when I think about 2024 and what's ahead for us, I think about us traveling through the hards and the the goods and the bads together. And I think it'll be better because we have that. And if you're at home and don't have that, or if you are new to this church and don't have that, I want you to know that you can have that here in this family of God. And you need it. Come be connected to family of God. It's here for us. 
And it's not the pastor that brings it, right? It's God who brings it, and it's all of us who bring it through God at work in us, right? We can't um, just speak about that, right? We have to actually live that together, amen? amen? But I want you to know that this family of God here at UOLC desires to be that kind of family for each other, and we will foster that even unto death for each other. We will sacrifice for one another where it is needed. We will look to the other's needs, and then others will look to our needs, and God will do good works in this community. And here's what I also see ahead for 2024 in a beautiful way. I see God drawing us together in community in such a way that we are ready to receive other people in a way that is good. Have you ever been a part of something you're like, I'm, I'm really hoping this gets better because I'd like to invite other people into it, but it's not so great. <laughs> I'd be scared to invite somebody else in. I'm not scared about that with you guys. <laughs> I actually think we're poised and ready to reach out to the Mill Run area in a way that is invigorating to me. And it makes me go, who else needs Jesus that does not have Jesus? Or who else needs the family of God like we are blessed with? We are blessed with an incredible abundance of riches in this family, amen? Amen. We have so much at our disposal, human-wise, human potential-wise, resource-wise, And I love how God puts it on our heart to share it with others. So I see that ahead for us. And I also see the fact that we're not going to lose heart regardless of what situations may come. We're going to remind each other of what our hope is in Jesus Christ. So ask for the Lord to help you see what is unseen. Ask for the Lord to lift your eyes beyond what is seen to what is unseen. Ask him to actually bring those things more into um, collection and togetherness versus keeping them separate, as if eternity is only out there for when I die. The kingdom is now, the kingdom is here. As a follower of Jesus, you indeed have one foot here, and you have one foot in eternity already. It's true, it's profound, it's real, but we wanna praise God for it. And so let's go to the table and let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this family of brothers and sisters that you've given to us. We want to thank you for your presence. We want to thank you for the times when that veil between heaven and earth feels so thin that we we really do see how active you are and how you're at work around us all the time. Would you prompt us in 2024 to seek your presence in a way that that veil seems thinner all the more and all more regularly? That is something that we have to practice, Lord, because our minds tilt towards what is seen so easily and what is in our faces. And so we ask, Lord, for eyes to see you, ears to hear you, that you might bring great purpose, great satisfaction to our day-to-day what is seen, that what is unseen would, would come in and, and bring your kingdom. So we pray over and over again, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth here in Columbus, here in our homes, here in our neighborhoods, as it is in heaven. Thank you, God, for this life that we get to live. We praise you for it. And thank you for your forgiveness, which we now get to enjoy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're gonna